Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, I'm so genuinely pleased to uh, be here, and thank you for that introduction. And um, I guess the 2015 uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, Angus Deaton, a um, economist at Princeton University. And in his acceptance speech, which was just recently published, uh, Deaton wrote, uh, we are wise to remember the importance of good data and not to ne neglect the challenges that measurement continuously uh, poses. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to contrast that with uh, another, uh, other famous words by um, uh, Simon Kuznets, who was a very important economist in the economics of inequality in the 1950s. And Kuznets um, is known for saying that before measurement, there was theory, or something like that. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do today is sort of skirt that line between measurement and theory, and uh, in that uh, gray area, speak to some important issues about public policy dealing with uh, social mobility. Okay. And um, before we begin, I guess, to appreciate the uh, the topic, um, you have to know something about my taste in music. So here is one of my musical heroes. Does anyone recognize this person? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, Europeans would know that that's uh, Leonard Cohen. And I've taken a, um, a, a few lines from one of Leonard Cohen's uh, um, songs that I think hits on the, uh, the theme of this discussion. Now, if you know anything about Leonard Cohen, He's a Canadian, and his origins are in the city of Montreal. And anyone who's visited Montreal understands the geography of the city. It's dominated by a, a mountain, basically, a hill. And you can imagine who lives on the top of the hill. Uh, housing prices uh, go up as you uh, rise higher in elevation. And Cohen was raised on the top of this hill, uh, West Mount. And uh, he certainly had uh, astounding talents. And he became uh, a folk uh, musician, uh, a poet, a novelist, a superstar. Uh, but he was a superstar that started at the top from a very uh, privileged uh, of, of family. And um, uh, if we have time uh, during the question period, uh, I'd be happy to sing a little bit of uh, Leonard Cohen if you want. So start. We, we, both of us don't want that, so start thinking of your questions now. <laughs> but I'd like to contrast uh, uh, Leonard Cohen, who started at the top and uh, uh, ended up uh, at the top, uh, with another one of my um, musical uh, stars. Does anyone know who this is? Yes. That's Shania Twain. And Shania Twain, as well, it was, was an extremely, is an extremely uh, uh, successful uh, country pop musician. In the 1990s, I think she sold uh, more CDs than anybody else had uh, previously. And I, I believe she still has a beautiful uh, house on the shores of, 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 of Lake Geneva. Uh, currently, she's doing shows in uh, Las Vegas and, and continue to make, uh, I think, a good deal of money. Uh, her her career started in Nashville, uh, Tennessee. Uh, she was a backup singer for some country songs. But most people don't appreciate that Shania Twain is also a Canadian. She's from the Canadian province of Ontario, where I'm from, uh, and actually the northern part of that uh, province. Um, Shania Twain started at the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. She was one of five children who had three different biological fathers. Her stepfather was of Aboriginal origin. And the family um, went through, I think it's charitable to say, some very challenging times. In her autobiography, she talks about moving continually as a child, uh, always one step ahead of the rent, living at one point in a, in a basement apartment with dirt uh, floors. This is a woman who went from the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and rose to the very top. So, uh, when, Cohen sings, um, when Cohen sings, the poor stay poor, the rich get rich, it's probably true to some extent for him, um, but we should imagine also a great deal of mobility in which family background really doesn't determine uh, uh, destiny. And so these two faces are the very extreme examples 
of social mobility. Um, by social mobility, we, um, we can have, um, by that term, I mean the relationship between a child's outcome in life and his or her uh, family background. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today, that kind of movement um, between generations, uh, whether uh, family is destiny for children and what we should be doing about it in the rich countries. So I'd like to begin basically uh, with these stories in mind, but uh, now to move to um, the data, if you will, uh, the data as best as I can represent it, to raise three questions for you that are based upon three facts. So if nothing else, if you leave this presentation, you should at least take away these three facts. And the first is that intergenerational earnings mobility, social mobility uh, framed through uh, an income perspective, varies a good deal. Uh, it varies in, uh, across these OECD countries that I've put up here. So the way to interpret this particular statistic is this way. If your family made twice as much as my family, 100% more than my family, on average, I would expect you as an adult to be making 50% more than me if we lived in countries like the United Kingdom, Italy, and the United States. On the other hand, if we grew up in Finland, Norway, or Denmark, that huge advantage that you have uh, over me, the 100% uh, advantage uh, uh, in your family uh, background in, in income differences, would shrink in a matter of a generation to just a less than 20% advantage. So if we grew up in Norway or Denmark, uh, I'd only expect you to be making 15 to 20% more than me. Mm -hmm. That's a very significant difference. But the question I want to leave you with after we consider this fact, does it require a policy intervention? What is the optimal rate of social mobility? Or uh, do these differences reflect some underlying fundamentals that are not open to policy discussion uh, anyways? Okay. So that's fact one, uh, social mobility varies. And I stress it because there are some differing opinions uh, in the literature uh, 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 about that. Um, for the economists in the room, this is the intergenerational earnings elasticity. There are a lot of other measures that I could focus on, and we'll talk about those briefly. It varies, but it varies in a particular way. So in this picture, I've taken our, our, internet, uh, our social mobility measure, and um, it continues to um, be represented in the vertical dimension here. So it's the same statistic ranging from about 0.1 to 0.5, 10% to 50%. But I've cross-tabulated it with uh, a measure of, a uh, common measure of inequality about a generation ago. So in the 1980s, uh, this Gini coefficient uh, was highest in the United Kingdom, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the United States, and Italy. Okay? They, those are the countries that at that point in time had a very high level of inequality compared to others. So you can think of the Gini coefficient as a um, expected difference in incomes between any two people. Two times the Gini coefficient is the expected difference in incomes relative to the average. So if we took any two random uh, Americans, uh, we would expect uh, their average income difference to be about 70% when the Gini is 0.35. Okay? On the other hand, uh, countries like Finland, Norway, and Denmark were the most equal societies a generation ago. What you want to take away from here, this fact is, societies that tend to be more unequal at a point in time are societies in which there is less social mobility. There is more stickiness between the incomes of parents and their children in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Italy than there is in some of the Nordic countries. And this curve was given the name the Great Gatsby Curve by one of President um, Obama's former advisors, Alan Kruger, in about uh, 2012. So this is the Great uh, Gatsby Curve. It's the relationship between inequality and social mobility. And it's a relationship that somehow challenges uh, our perspective of ourselves, certainly for Americans, um, a society that has traditionally tolerated much higher levels of inequality because there was so much movement in the income distribution. Yes, Americans tell themselves we have a lot more inequality, 
but anybody can move to the top. And certainly, if you can't, um, with your own energies and talents and perseverance, move yourself to the top of the income distribution, you can certainly hope as much for your children. And that defining metaphor is sort of being questioned uh, in this graph. And that's in part the reason that President Obama used this to sort of frame some of the election issues around the uh, 2012 uh, election. So where mobility is lower, inequality is higher, does this have public policy relevance? Uh, you could imagine here a simple Robin Hood policy. Well, tax the rich, give to the poor, and you've solved two problems at once. You've made inequality smaller in the here and now, and you've promoted mobility in the next generation. I don't think we can make statements like that without first understanding the underlying drivers. All right? What this curve is missing are whole layers of forces that are binding inequality through opportunities to social mobility. And so we have to understand those kinds of drivers before we can appreciate the policy implications of this second fact. Okay? And the third fact is related to just that. Inequality is on the rise. Does that mean we are moving towards less social mobility as a result? In this picture, which I've taken from a very important uh, OECD publication, and I commend it to you, um, it's called Divided We Stand, uh, it documents the fact that, uh, something we all know in this room, that in many countries, inequality has been rising over the last two or three decades. So the way to interpret this uh, um, uh, uh, plot is the base of these arrows is the level of the Gini coefficient in 1985, and the tip of the arrow is the Gini coefficient in 2008, just before uh, the Great Recession. So for all, most of these economies, inequality has been going up. And the question I'd like to put to you, and I hope we can make, uh, take some steps in answering, is are societies experiencing more inequality likely also to experience uh, less social mobility? Do we risk sliding up the Great Gatsby uh, curve? Okay, so those are three facts uh, that I think in and of themselves are important in the sense that uh, Angus Deaton has told us that measurement I I is important. But we can't get to policy without really considering economic theory in the way that Kuznets, Kuznets has also focused our attention. So what I want to do in the rest of the talk is give you a framework drawn from standard economic theory to interpret these facts in a policy relevant uh, way. Uh, and then I can, we can start singing Shania Twain at the end if we have extra. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, all right. So any questions uh, of a clarification uh, nature? Have I, um, have I sort of presented this clearly? Or are there any crucial concepts that are confusing? Yes? Could you take this first slide again, please? This one, yes. You ask whether this asks for a policy intervention. But is the fact that there are so different mobility levels not a consequence of different policies? Yes. So that's exactly where I want to go. What are the drivers here? And I think you've said it correctly. So this is one of my conclusions. Let's just pause here. That uh, to some extent, this is a policy choice. That public policy can influence mobility. But there are other things going on as well. And I want to illustrate those other things as well. That's one of the big three that I'm going to focus on. So that's a good way to move forward. So these are my three, um, three questions derived from uh, these three facts. And um, I think we're going to get to your question in point two of this. Okay. All right, so I'm an economist. And you have to allow me at least one equation. Otherwise, uh, I'm not going to feel totally satisfied with myself. And this is a famous equation uh, that's due to Francis Galton in the 1800s. And it reflects a regression to the mean. And I'm not even going to talk about it. But the important thing that we are estimating here is uh, this particular parameter that relates a parent's income to a child's income. And this is our stickiness parameter. This is the intergenerational elasticity. Think of this as a, as a gradient of incomes. 
If you have a parental uh, income uh, in a horizontal way and you have um, uh, a child's adult income in, in a vertical dimension, you know, is that a flat gradient or is it a very steep gradient? All right. What this elasticity tells us is the percentage difference in child adult incomes for every percentage difference in their parents' income. Much in the way I talked about it, your parent having twice as much as mine, how much would we expect that 100% gap to shrink in a generation? The more it shrinks, all right, the greater the degree of mobility. If there is no relationship between your income and your parents' income, then my best guess of your income is just the average income of your cohort. Okay? There's complete mobility. All right? And as this um, elasticity moves to one, there's more and more uh, stickiness. But this is all expressed in percentage terms. See, I'm not saying anything here about whether the next generation as a whole will be better off than the previous generation. All right? And that's an important dimension of mobility. Where will our children be able to own their own houses? Will they do better than we did as a, as a, as a, as a collective? That's wrapped up with sort of the notion of productivity and, 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 and growth over time. So you can see why social mobility has become a, a very hot topic in the wake of the Great Recession. There is nothing like seeing the economic pie shrink in front of your very eyes to make you a little bit more concerned about how the pie is being shared and whether the next generation is doing better. And to have a full discussion about that, we need to appreciate absolute mobility as well. So for the most part, I'm not going to talk about uh, absolute mobility. It's about relative position. If your parents were in the top 10%, what are the chances you would be in the top 10%? If your parents were in the bottom 10%, what are the chances you would be in the bottom 10% without saying what it means in income terms to be in the bottom 10 or the top 10? The other caveat that you have to be aware of in this statistic is that for international comparisons, a lot of the focus is on just fathers and sons. So I, I misspoke a little bit when I presented the Great Gatsby curve. It's not between parents and children. It actually just represents the relationship between fathers and sons. We do that in the literature for a number of reasons. One, a blind spot. <laughs> uh, two, uh, data limitations. And three, maybe a generation or more ago, uh, family income was uh, well proxied by a father's income. Uh, labor market participation of women has been changing a good deal. That makes modeling this a little bit more complicated. So to maximize the number of cross, um, countries in your cross-country comparison, um, the focus is often on fathers and sons because that's where I can uh, get as many countries into the uh, Great Gatsby Curve as possible. Um, but the literature is much broader than I'm representing it. Um, in my own country, for example, Canada, which has an intergenerational elasticity of about 0.3 um, for men, uh, that's a little bit lower for uh, fathers, uh, daughters, or when you look at family income. So those estimates are, 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 are out there. The other thing, when you hear policymakers speak, and um, the current chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, in the United States, Jason Furman, uh, gave a speech on this, you'll hear them talk about upward mobility. And this is a nice way of framing this discussion for policy purposes. We want every poor child to become everything they can be. We want them to be able to move up in the income distribution. But that's not what this statistic is talking about. It's not giving you a sense of directional change. It's an overall average measure of the degree of mobility. And so to get more refined, you probably want to rely on this literature to look at um, um, measures that have embodied in them this notion of upward movement, or, and for that matter, downward movement. The intergenerational elasticity is sort of like uh, an intergenerational Gini coefficient. It's an overall uh, average portrayal of the degree of social mobility. So if you need one number, this is your go-to number. But obviously, one number can't focus everything uh, uh, that's relevant for policy discussions. All right, so keep those caveats in mind. But this number often is also equated with equality of opportunity. Okay? So that's what gives this economics literature and this, this statistical literature such resonance for many people. Because if family background is very tightly related to ultimate outcomes, it makes us question whether there are equalities of opportunity. All right? 
And I want to perhaps suggest a little bit of caution in moving uh, from this statistic to the philosophical concept of equality of opportunity and suggest to you that uh, societies can legitimately differ in the degree of social mobility because equality of opportunity inherently involves a value judgment. This is what I have in mind. And I'm borrowing uh, this slide from the um, economist, philosopher, mathematician, uh, John Romer, who works at uh, 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 Yale University. And in Romer's framework, some inequality is morally defensible and some fraction of inequality is not defensible morally. And the dividing line between these types of equality is made by this distinction between circumstance and effort. Okay? If circumstances beyond your control determine your outcomes in life, we should not hold you responsible for that. In fact, society should compensate you for that. Okay? On the other hand, that part of your outcomes that's due to effort is something an individual should take responsibility for, not be compensated uh, uh, for. So where you draw this line between circumstance and effort, okay, circumstance reflecting inequalities of opportunity, is very important. And we're asking ourselves, well, just what playing field should policymakers seek to level? And Romer suggests to us that uh, we can imagine four different playing fields. Imagine a society in which ch a child's outcome in life is determined entirely by social connections and even in ex extreme nepotism to get access to health care, education, and even jobs. Connections matter. Okay? I would uh, suggests that most citizens of the OECD would feel that those kinds of inequalities should be compensated for. We don't want to live in a society of, of nepotism. If that's what's driving things, that's a circumstance that should be leveled. At the other extreme, parents influence their children in all sorts of ways, not just by, in some cases, getting them jobs with the family firm, but more subtly by forming their, their beliefs, their press preferences, their aspirations. Uh, indeed, uh, Romer says, that's why we have children, to pass on those beliefs and preferences. Should that be a circumstance that policymakers should um, try to level as well? How deeply should public policy cut into the workings uh, uh, of the family? And obviously, we'll, we will make those judgments differently in different societies, um, depending upon how we define circumstance and effort. And we can't abstract uh, from value judgments in making that. So perhaps it's the case that intergenerational mobility, social mobility, varies across these countries because they embody very different value judgments about the place and role of family in economic life. We have to give that, uh, I think, to some of these differences. Um, perhaps also if ability is innate, if it's all genetic, and you'll hear this story, then some societies that are more heterogeneous in their makeup, um, well, we should expect them to have uh, uh, much different rates of social mobility than societies that are very homogeneous. And so the United States, for some reason, is often compared to Denmark. And it seems to me that's not a very fair comparison for these types of reasons. There's a whole uh, different attitude to immigration, to belonging, to family dynamics in the United States than there is in Denmark. And there's not much you could do uh, along those dimensions to change the United States into Denmark. Um, and so that's one way of also interpreting the very big differences. The United States has a great um, deal of stickiness across incomes because, in fact, that reflects equality of uh, uh, opportunity. Just people are very different, and the garden is very fertile, so some can grow much taller than others. Okay? You'd have to ex 
except that somehow this ability is innate. All right? And I'm going to suggest that possibly we can't go that far. All right? So I'm going to leave this discussion here on our first question uh, just by asserting, basically, that some significant fraction of those differences in social mobility of these countries should be a public policy concern without suggesting to policymakers that there's a specific target that you should uh, aim for. After all, no country has totally eliminated the relationship between parent and child incomes, not even in the most mobile countries like uh, uh, Denmark or, 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 or Norway. Okay? So we should not think of a completely flat parent-child uh, gradient, an intergenerational elasticity of zero, uh, as a goal for public policy without this appreciation that it's very difficult and involves a value judgment uh, in drawing that line between circumstance and effort. But we do need theory to appreciate what the underdry, uh, underlying causal mechanisms are. Is it all innate ability that's driving this? So I want to sort of move now to uh, the second question of uh, what are the um, underlying drivers of the Great Gatsby Curve and how should we uh, interpret it? And just to pick up uh, on what was said, uh, the first thing I want to leave you with is that one of these underlying drivers, and theory teaches us this, is the nature of public policy. Public policy is a social choice and it determines social mobility. I will assert that. Um, but public policy can, uh, uh, is a knife that cuts with, with two edges. Um, policies that are relatively more advantage, of more advantage to the disadvantage will promote upward mobility. Okay? Public policy offers family insurance in a climate of a very um, hostile and volatile labor market. There's basic income insurance, but public policy also invests in the human capital of children. If that insurance and, and if those investments are progressive in the sense of being of relatively more advantage to the disadvantage, public policy is a force for more social mobility. On the other hand, we can arrange our education systems. We can arrange our health care systems. We can arrange our tax and transfer systems to be of relatively more benefit to the relatively well-to-do. And in that case, public policy will promote inequality and it will erode uh, social mobility. Okay? But, and here is my quote-unquote uh, simultaneous equations model uh, explaining the underlying causal forces. Public policy works in conjunction with two other fundamental institutions in society that determine a child's uh, outcomes in life, the family and the market. And these three forces interact and overlap in different ways uh, in uh, the OECD countries, or in all countries for that matter. And it's in having this institutional knowledge and in how these forces interact that helps you understand why countries occupy a particular position on the great Catsby curve, okay? I think whether you are progressive or conservative or in American terms, red or blue, um, you have to accept the fact that the family is a fundamental force determining child outcomes. Families with more human capital invest more in their children and families with more children on a per capita basis have less resources to invest per child. So that family environment is very, very important. But saying that, I think we also have to appreciate that families interact with labor markets. And labor markets have become more and more uh, polarized. Uh, and how a family finds its way in the labor market is important not only for its monetary resources, but also for the time and all the other non-monetary resources imp uh, important uh, for, for, for their children. If a child is in a single-parent family or in a two-parent family where all the parents are working many hours per week, uh, there is a higher risk of falling through uh, the cracks. The quality of the home environment could change. So this interaction between family and market is something we really need to understand. And the extent to which the state moves in between those spheres, shielding and buffering the family and supporting it in this era of higher inequality is, is, is also important. So let me give you some stylized facts to sort of show you that these hypotheses make sense. 
What I'm relating to you here, again in the vertical dimension, is our intergenerational elasticity. So remember, the lower you are here, the more social mobility, the less stickiness of earnings between generations. And as you move up in this vertical direction, parent and child outcomes are more and more strongly uh, uh, related. But I've changed the horizontal dimension now. It's not uh, inequality. It's the earnings premium to having uh, a, a university education. So the numbers in the horizontal direction are uh, taken from the OECD. They are the ratio of um, earnings for uh, someone who on average, uh, or, or rather uh, young men, uh, who have uh, a university degree relative to uh, a similarly aged cohort who have a high school degree. So this is the earning pre uh, earnings premium of higher education over stopping your education at high school. If we, leave, if we live in um, Norway or Denmark, uh, someone with a university degree makes, I don't know, 10 to not quite 20% more than someone with a high school uh, diploma only. So the returns to education aren't all that great. Whereas in the United States, okay, someone with a, a college degree, uh, a university degree, uh, makes 70 or 80% as much as someone with a high school diploma. Okay? So there has been a lot of ink spilled in the applied labor economics literature on the returns to education. And so this is one marker of the returns uh, to edu uh, education. And the returns to education have gone up significantly in some uh, countries. But the returns to education are also one important fundamental driver of the degree of inequality in a society. So it's not surprising that the United States has a much higher Gini coefficient. No, the returns to education are also much higher. The demand for skills has gone up, supply has not kept up, and people who have those college degrees are earning a heck of a lot more. Okay? That is an underlying driver, and it's a marker of the nature of the labor market of the Great uh, Gatsby Curve, and you continue to see a positive relationship here. The outliers are as interesting as people who are uh, groups that are on this curve. So here's a, a, a good old Italy in which the returns to education are not all that great, yet the degree of social mobility is really low. So that's suggesting to us whatever is driving social mobility in uh, Italy, it's, it's probably got less to do with the structure of the returns to education in the labor market than other forces. Okay? Uh, but you clearly see this positive relationship. The United States is where it is on the uh, um, uh, Gatsby curve because there's a great deal of inequality in the labor market that's in part driven by uh, college education. So if getting a university or a college degree really matters a lot, who gets it? So what I'm giving you here is again our measure of social mobility in the vertical direction. But here, in the horizontal direction, I displayed for you another gradient. And this is not the income to income gradient between parents and children, but the education to education gradient. So the way to interpret this statistic is, for every extra year of education for the parents, how many extra years does the child get? Okay? So in the United Kingdom, that's over six-tenths of a year on average. All right. So if you have a, uh, a family that has a university degree in the United Kingdom, you're virtually guaranteed that your children will not drop out of high school. Okay? All right. So there's a very tight relationship between education outcomes. All right? If education matters, in the UK, the well-educated get that for their kids in a way that's different in other countries where that gradient is much, much, much flatter. Okay? So it's interestingly, in the United States and in Canada, my country, the education gradient is about the same. And yet, these two countries have very different rates of social mobility. The difference is not so much in the structure of the education system and who gets access to good education uh, in these countries, but it probably has more to do with families in the labor market. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, people with more human capital all right, will pass on more human capital to their kids because of the structure of the education system in some countries. How we organize 
these fundamental institutions that determine a child's capabilities in life seem also to be an important driver. I'll make that point a little bit differently in, in this graph. I've organized uh, a group of 14-year-old Americans into three groups. Those whose parents had um, a high level of education, a medium level, and a low level of education. So low means the parent in the household with the highest education does not have anything more than a high school diploma. High means at least one of the parents, if both are present, has a, a college uh, degree. And these are uh, measures of the fraction of children who have mastered different mathematical skills according to their parental background. So most children by the age of 14 can multiply and divide in the United States whether their parents have a high school degree or not. Okay? But it does tend to dip a little bit uh, if you're coming from the least advantaged families. But um, even some basic tasks like mastering fractions, okay? even if you, we might wonder about this, uh, even if your parents have a college diploma, only about 60% of those 14-year-olds have mastered fractions in the United States. That in and of itself is something to be concerned about. <laughs> but what's, what I want to draw your eye to is just how sharp that gradient is. Less than one in five children whose parents have no more than a high school degree can do fractions. Okay? That's at the cusp of high school. All right? So this is an important crossroads in life as you enter into high school and you don't have these basic math skills and there's a strong gradient to family background. So what's happening in the family? I'll just generalize this statistic. Can you see this? Okay, it's a little bit unclear here. But um, I've taken those test scores or the survey I've used has a continuous measure of those test scores. Zero is the average and if you're way out here, you're doing really well in math. And if you're way down here, you're not doing so well. And this is the fraction of children uh, uh, reaching a particular level in this mathematics test uh, according to their parental education. So these are the kids whose parents have a high school diploma or less, and these are the parents whose kids have a university degree or more. If this is the average, what this says is that if your parents have a college degree, 80% of those kids are doing better than the overall national average. Okay? If your parents only have a high school diploma, what, 60 or 70% of, uh, of those kids are below average. Okay? There's this huge difference across the entire distribution according to parental background. This isn't about grade 8 just before you start high school. But the remarkable thing is, if I used an, um, an, an age-appropriate math test when the children are in kindergarten, just starting school, this is what the test scores would look like. You can pretty well predict in the United States a child's position or math skills at age 14 by knowing their skills at age 5. Okay? So that whole intervening period of primary school didn't do very much to level the playing field in the United States. And the origins of this inequality start early in a child's life in family background. Okay? That's the message we could take uh, 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 from this. We have some of this data uh, for, I think, three other countries to which the United States can reasonably be compared with. Uh, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Uh, all countries that have sort of a, a common history are very diverse, uh, largely immigrant countries. Um, and yet the United Kingdom uh, and the, um, the United State, uh, States uh, stand out as different from Canada and Australia. All right, so this is a, a, repl a replical story. I could do it for reading scores. The, the situation is even worse. Um, so I want to say to you that what a family, uh, what the structure of the family is and how the family invests in its children is very important. And a couple of things matter, and certainly money matters. So I took this quote from a Forbes magazine, um, an enterprising reporter at around this time of year, about two or three years ago, asked herself, 
what are the top 10 jobs that new graduates from uh, university or college are getting that did not even exist 10 years ago? Okay? So you can imagine things like an app developer, a market research data miner, a social media manager. These were all popular jobs, occupations for the new graduates that did not even exist for graduates of a decade earlier. But what caught my eye was this new uh, occupation called educational or admissions consultant. When a certain set of affluent parents watch their toddler stack his or her first set of blocks, they're not lost in the moment of cute. They're strategizing that their child's likeliness of getting into the right preschool. These moms and dads will stop at nothing to secure the best education for their kids, which for many includes hiring an educational or admissions consultant to help ease the process of interviewing and testing into schools from pre years to college, from preschool to college. Admissions consultants can be paid thousands of dollars for their skills, which often include personal connections with school administrators. <laughs> okay? So what's happening is the labor market has changed. It's become much more polarized. If you're going to get ahead in life, you have to cross through a gateway called higher education. That higher inequality gives some parents two things, more resources and more incentives to invest in their kids and start a race to the top earlier and earlier in a child's life cycle. That vicious circle is much more of a a chance of happening in higher inequality societies than in other societies. Inequality of the labor market is shadowing itself into the family and into the structure of the school system. You don't need a story, you can see it in the data. These are patterns in enrichment expenditures uh, in the United States. And I've taken this from a lovely paper by Greg Duncan and Dick Mur Murnane. And you have um, these interest expenditures being money spent on things outside of school that enhance your child's human capital. Uh, books, computers, high quality childcare, summer camps, private schooling, and so on. In the 1970s, there was a difference between those in the bottom 20% um, uh, uh, and those in the top 20%. We certainly expect that. But what's important here is just how big that gap has become as society has become more and more unequal, all right? So inequality matters to what parents do to uh, and for their kids. Money matters. It's one of the causal forces. But I'm going to suggest to you that parents do a lot more than just spend money on their kids. They invest in their kids in all sorts of ways. Here is a chart uh, from uh, using US data of the chances that a son will work with the very same firm as his father. Okay? So one of the things parents do for their kids is they help them make the transition into the labor market. They offer networks and connections and information and sometimes they even control hiring processes and hire their kids. And so what you can see here is a clear gradient. If your parents were in the, um, in the United States in the top 10% of the income distribution, 13% uh, of those children will uh, have a job with not the same occupation, not the same industry, but exactly the same employer as the father. And that advantage does not extend to the same degree uh, though, uh, to those in the lower part of the income distribution. I should stress, this is not unique to the United States. So here I have similar information for Canada and Denmark. So we've gone from a very immobile, socially immobile country like the United States to a mediumly mobile country like Canada to a very socially mobile country like Denmark. And here are the patterns, the fractions of children that have um, uh, at some time report the same employer as their father arranged by the father's place in the income distribution. Uh, top one percenters over here, bottom over here. So uh, on average in Canada, about four in 10 young men work for the same employer as their father. But if your father was in the top 1%, seven out of 10 of, every, every, uh, of those children work for the same employer as their father. And that's a very important transmission mechanism at the top. If you don't get that advantage at the top, uh, don't work in the same employer, you're gonna fall down the income distribution. 
So parents can set a glass floor on their kids, not just by virtue of money, but by also control and, and connections. I'm not sure that there's something we can do about this, but there is something we can do about the situation of the relatively disadvantaged. And let me move uh, very quickly just by summarizing, I think, uh, one point for the United States, and then we can turn to, to the questions. Across a whole host of dimensions, the United States and, the, and, and in part the United Kingdom are distinguished in how um, a children from relatively disadvantaged families uh, affair. What I'm, going to what I'm giving you here is the percentage of mothers who work full time. So um, parents who only have a uh, high school diploma uh, are actually putting in a lot more hours in the labor market than uh, parents who have a college degree. So you have to sort of worry then about balancing work and family life and how public policy uh, does that. And it doesn't do it very well in some countries and does it much better than in uh, others. But um, I also want to point out to you that the family is in a great deal of flux in the United States and somewhat in the United Kingdom. And you see it more cl most clearly in this gradient. This is the uh, fraction of children born to a teen uh, mother. And that's as high as uh, uh, one in five uh, for uh, um, parents with low levels of education in the United States. And it really, although that rate is falling now in the United States, it really stands out from uh, other countries. So there's something tr tremendous going on in the American family and how it integrates with a, um, with a more polarized labor market that public policy hasn't really taken the edges uh, off of. All right, so let me conclude with the um, three answers to my three questions based upon my three facts. Social mobility as measured by generational earnings mobility varies across the rich countries, and I suggest to you that this variation should be a public policy concern. I've also suggested there's some caution in trying to develop a target or optimal level of uh, social mobility. It varies with inequality, uh, and while inequality is a cause, it's not the sole cause. It's not like the Great Gatsby Curve gives you uh, a recipe or menu of policy options. Okay? It is a signal inequality of a whole set of uh, forces associated with inequalities in families, inequalities in the market, and the degree of uh, progressivity in, in, sta in the state. And my third point, which I want to leave sort of more as a conjecture, with growing inequality, the kind that we've seen over the last two or three decades, the more unequal societies will likely not experience more social mobility without concerted and effective uh, uh, public uh, policies. Uh, so we can either start singing or ask uh, 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 questions. Thank you very much.